Good morning again, and welcome to Glen Ridge Bible Church this morning. It's wonderful to have you here with us. I'm just very thankful that we can still continue to gather together. Just again, would refer you to your bulletins that are a part of this attachment. It's on our website. Uh, there is a prayer list there that I would like all of you to consider. There are many of us who need prayer. We all need prayer. And there are praises, of course, to thank God for his goodness and his faithfulness to us. So we thank you for that, uh, if you could do that. We're going to turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 7. We're going to continue on. And as I said last week, we're going to start to chew off larger chunks in this wonderful historical book of the New Testament. And last week set up the office of the deacon, and the emphasis was on Stephen and how he would step forward full of faith and power, doing wonderful signs, wonderful miracles, and the reality that he'd be persecuted for his testimony for Christ. And so he was brought before the Sanhedrin, and all the council in verse 15 of the previous chapter looked steadfastly unto him and saw his face as the face of an angel as he testified of Jesus, despite the, the lies that were brought before him and the false accusations as they recruited false witnesses, claiming that he blasphemed the law of Moses and the temple itself. So we're going to open in chapter 7, and Stephen's going to address the accusations that were made toward him. And what's fascinating is as we unfold this chapter, and we're, we're unfortunately not going to be able to give it the attention it's due. We're only going to pick apart certain pieces here and there. I'd encourage you in your own time to study it. But throughout it all, he never defends himself. He testifies of the faithfulness of God. And so we pick up in verse 1, and listen closely because we'll be jumping through. We're not going to be reading all 50 plus verses. So please follow along closely. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? Verse 1. And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. And then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land, and that he would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage I will judge, said God, and after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, verse 9, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. Verse 11, Now a famine and great trouble came over the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when God heard that there was grain, or pardon me, when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. And so Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. Verse 17. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. Verse 21, But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt, of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deed. Let's move down to verse 30. And when forty years had passed in the desert, in the wilderness, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Sinai. And when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not to look. 
Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. Verse 37. That is that Moses said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, verse 41, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. And God turned and gave them up to worship the hosts of heaven, as is written in the book of prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star and the star of your god Rephim, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away to Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land promised by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the day of David. David, who found favor before God, asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all of these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And he killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, and they stoned Stephen. As he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down, cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Loving Father, we pray your blessing on the reading of your word this morning. As we un unpack the history of Israel, we see again your faithfulness and the reality that we are sniff-necked people, oftentimes rejecting your mercy and grace. Lord, we pray for your mercy and grace this morning. We pray for the revelation of your word, and that we grow in our knowledge and wisdom of the Lord Jesus. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a lengthy chapter, and I tried to read as much as I could to make emphasis on what we're going to be learning on today. It's Acts chapter 7, and we are speaking about Stephen, who was a disciple on trial. The Apostle Peter and the Apostle John, the Apostle Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, Stephen, these men all have a commonality when it comes to their experiences with these religious leaders. They faced unjust trials for standing on the solid truth, on the solid ground of truth, and faith and trust in Christ. They were each dragged before the Sanhedrin and tried as guilty men for blasphemy against God. That was the charge. The charge was replacing the law, altering the law, and a disregard for the temple. These, of course, were false accusations, which ultimately find their root in the hearts of the Pharisees, that of jealous hearts, and the rest of the Jewish council. They, they couldn't perform 
They couldn't perform the miracles that the disciples were performing. They did not teach as the disciples did. They didn't understand the law as the disciples were learning from the Holy Spirit. They considered them upstarts and uneducated men and as uneducated men. In the eyes of the Sanhedrin, they had absolutely no authority to challenge the absolute authority of the council. They were the experts on the law of Moses. They were the experts on righteousness. They considered themselves to be those who were closest to God. They were the Sanhedrin. They were the most religious and most dedicated of the Jews when it came to the law and personal righteousness. They were the ones who blessed the people in the synagogues. They blessed them with their wisdom and their knowledge of the law, the application of the law. They were the ones who considered themselves the keepers of the peace. They oversaw the temple and they oversaw the ceremonies and the priesthood. And they were, in their estimation, the final and authoritative voice of God on the earth. At least that's what they believed. Ultimately, when one studies the Sanhedrin, they were ultimately politicians, corrupted religious leaders who sought nothing but preserving their livelihood, their fame, their fortune, and keeping some type of peace between the Jews and Rome. But the Lord described them as whitewashed tombs, saying, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Hypocrites, like an actor wearing a mask and playing a part. That's what hypocrite means. For you are all like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful. They kept the law to its most minute detail, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. Matthew 23 and 27. It's before this very corrupted council that Stephen now stands accused of blasphemy against the law and against the beautiful temple. The temple was the heartbeat of first century Judaism. And so here is Stephen, one of the seven chosen to the newly appointed office of deacon, now dragged before the same religious court of the Jews that condemned the Lord Jesus Christ and threatened Peter and John in just a few few chapters earlier in the rest of the apostles. And what he will do is he will give the longest speech of anyone in the book of Acts. It's the first sermon from a non-apostle given in the book. And he will go on to be the first believer to die for the faith. And as I said in the opening, how does he defend himself? When an accusation is made against us, we typically take a position where we feel we need to defend ourselves. Stephen never does that. He defends himself by preaching the glorious mercy and grace of God all throughout Israel's history. He shows Israel's unfaithfulness and how they consistently throughout the history of the nation reject God time and time again. Over and over again, they reject the very Lord that they claim to love. The one whom they had a covenant relationship with. God who chose the nation of Israel, not because they were the mightiest nation on the face of the earth, but because his heart was set upon them. God continually reached out to the nation. Even after being rejected again and again, he still continued to reach out to deliver the nation. This lengthy speech, 60 verses in chapter 7, breaks down into six parts, and we're not going to go through each, each part. But it breaks down essentially into, into six parts. You have the setting, and that would be Stephen on trial. So you can picture Stephen on trial and the accusations that were made against him. Blasphemer. He was a blasphemer against Moses, against the temple, and against God. Of course, these were all false accusations, as I said, founded in the jealousy and the insecurity of the Sanhedrin, who sought to preserve their power base. They had to recruit false witnesses, Acts 6 and 13. 
The second part transitions to Stephen's defense, which highlight the mercies of God throughout Israel's history. It's the birth of Israel through the divine election of Abram, who would become the father of Israel. The Abrahamic covenant, the promise of a permanent land for his nomadic descendants. The third portion would be the first rejection and deliverance through the hand of Joseph, the rejected son, who was sold, ultimately sold into Egyptian slavery. And during the time of those seven years of famine, he was the means of Israel's deliverance. God would use Joseph and his circumstances to preserve his newly founded nation here on the face of the earth. And then the fourth, fourth portion would be the second rejection and deliverance through God's Mos, uh, servant Moses. The revelation of God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob in the burning bush. The truth that God hears the cries of his people it was now, now was the appointed time of their deliverance and salvation. Moses was used by God, used by him as his instrument to deliver Israel from slavery, from the slavery they suffered in Egypt. And we witnessed the greatest salvation moment of the Old Testament when Israel leaves Egypt, a picture of the world, and is brought to the Red Sea, where the sea parts by the power of God through his servant Moses, and they were brought to safety. Fifth, the third rejection. When the people of Israel reject both Moses and God as their Savior. As Moses was on the mountaintop of Sinai receiving the oracles of God, the law of God, which is Sanhedrin claimed to be precious to them. The nation was at the foot of the mountain building a golden calf and rejecting, or pardon me, and rejoiced in the work of their own hands. And the sixth part, finally, the charges against God's people in the first century that throughout history they have resisted the work of the Holy Spirit that they were guilty of the murder of the prophets and the verdict of being guilty of not truly keeping the law. Stephen, the deacon, the man full of the Holy Spirit, full of power and grace, able to perform miracles, was now on trial for his life. His life was in imminent danger. His life was threatened. And instead of defending himself... He turns the accusation against the council and shows them clear, clearly how throughout the history of the nation, a people that he loved, he says that in verse 2, and clearly identified with, brethren and fathers, listen. He pleads with them as one of their own. A Jew pleading with the Jewish council, listen to the testimony of God throughout our people's history. And now the council was guilty. This council that he stood before were the ones truly again on trial as they were during the trial of Jesus Christ. They were guilty of rejecting God's message. How they had rejected the Messiah, God's own son. And this latest rejection was the most serious because it was a rejection of God himself in the person of his son. The charges of destroying the temple and all of Israel's sacred institutions were not by Christ or his disciples or the apostles. In fact, they were being destroyed by the people of God themselves, the Jews. Right from the beginning of the establishment of the law and the temple and the ceremonies, they have always misunderstood the point. Paul mentions this the purpose of the law when he records that they were a tutor for us to lead us to Christ. Galatians 3 and 24, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we, we may be justified by faith. Of all the people who put their trust in their righteous works, it is Paul who would say that we must be justified by faith. Ultimately, that is what the law teaches. 
The NIV puts it this way. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. You see, God loves his people so much that in every instance of disobedience, in every instance of misunderstanding, and every time they rejected him, he worked out their deliverance despite them being such a stubborn and stiff-necked people. And now God's final plan of deliverance, his, his ultimate end game, the, ultimate, the, the final phase in his salvation plan was his own son. But just like the past, this present generation misunderstood him, misunderstood Christ, and they rejected him. The nation in their religious leaders rejected God's own son, their Messiah. Sentencing, sentencing Jesus Christ to the agony and the horrors of the cross. We will not have this man to reign over us. So Stephen begins with the father of Israel, and a man who received the righteousness of God because of his faith. It emphasizes and reinforces the truth that salvation comes by faith. Trust in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Stephen begins at the beginning of the nation's history. It was God who called Abraham out, and Abram heard the call of God. God promised a land for an eternal inheritance if Abraham would get out of his present country and leave it all behind. Leave his past life, leave everything he trusted in, leave everything that gave him security and a sense of comfort, leave that all behind and go to a promised land that you have never seen before. And that required Abram to trust God. It mirrors the call of the sinner to leave his old life behind and inherit eternal life. But the offer was conditional. The land, an inheritance, descendants, the promise of one who would come who would bless all the nations was conditional as God was working out his eternal plan of salvation. It was all conditional on this. All this could be his, land, inheritance, descendants. But it depended on him getting out of his present situation and leave it all for the promised land. He had to give up all that security, all that familiarity, all the comforts of the world he had known for a land he had never seen. He had to make a choice. He had to make that choice at the call of God, and Abraham made the right choice. Abraham believed God. He believed God even when he had to bury his wife Sarah and didn't own one square foot of the land. In verse 5, God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. He believed in him prior to that when God promised him a son in his ripe old age. Some of those promises, of course, taking residence in the land, were never fulfilled in his lifetime, but he trusted God would keep his promises, and of course we know he did. Hebrews eleven thirteen and 16. Talk about those of the faith, and in Abraham's case, he died in faith, having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. That is, he did not experience them practically in his life on this side of glory. But he was so assured in the faithfulness of God, he died as though he could see his children, his descendants in the land. Abraham trusted him for land, descendants, even though he couldn't get those things in his own strength. He trusted God. He trusted the one who could. He even trusted God when he was told that his descendants would be mistreated slaves for 400 years. Abraham still trusted God. And he trusted the promise that eventually, after those 400 years, he would be delivered. So Abram moved. And he continually moved. And he continued to grow in his faith in God. He never, in a sense, spiritually parked, as it were. He kept growing in the faith. His faith grew. His trust in God grew as he saw the faithfulness of God. 
And so we should too, spiritually, we should continue to grow and move and trust in the promises and faithfulness of God. Keep growing spiritually. Keep trusting the Lord. Keep looking to his promises. See how he has been faithful even when we are unfaithful and like wayward sheep. Even when we are far from him. Recognize the faithfulness of God. Stephen shared this. Not only to show his common ancestry with the Jews and his deep respect for the father of the nation, but to clearly demonstrate that even in those days, in the infancy of the nation, in Abram, God was working out the salvation message that would be ultimately realized in their day in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. So, beloved, believe that our God is a God of faithfulness. Believe that he is a God of faithfulness. And believe that he's a God that keeps his promises. And just to remind his listeners, there was no temple then. And yet God was at work and God was speaking clearly. There was no temple then. Next, Stephen moves on to Joseph. The greatest human picture of Christ in the patriarchs, rejected by his brethren, but forgiving all those who did evil to him, just as the Lord Jesus Christ would on the cross. Rejected by his own brethren, his own brothers, God had chosen Joseph to be the hand of Israel's deliverance. Even then, the sons of Israel, the men who would give birth to the 12 tribes of Israel, even then, they were rejecting God's chosen deliverer. God would use the affliction of hunger and famine to force Joseph's brothers to search out help. And it brought them to the very feet, to the very feet of the brother they basically sentenced to death and outright rejected. They hated him. And yet for them to be saved from famine and death, they had to come to the brother that they rejected. Right throughout Genesis chapters 39 to 50, we have all the ups and downs of Joseph's life. Joseph's life was not an easy life. If you could say someone's life was unfair, it would be Joseph's life. Sold into slavery by his own brothers, rising up in Potiphar's house, and then accused of rape and thrown into prison, jailed, rescued, and became an interpreter of dreams, of Pharaoh's dream, and then rising up to becoming one of the most influential and powerful men in all of Egypt. And through all the ups and downs, God was with them. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, beloved. God strengthened him, delivered him, just as he did his own begotten son. God strengthened Christ in his humanity in the garden, sending an angel to encourage him. He gave him strength in his humanity to face the cross. And God would deliver his beloved son from the pains of death. That's his promise to us who believe. He promises to deliver us. When famine devastated the ancient world, including the family of Jacob, Joseph prepared Egypt to weather the storm and was used by God to deliver his people. There will be another time when Israel will go through a time of famine and drought. Romans 11 and 26 describes it, that they will go through another time of famine and drought and tribulation. Then, then they will finally recognize Jesus as their salvation. Despite that envy and despite that jealousy of Joseph's brothers, Despite the envy and despite the jealousy of the Sanhedrin toward Jesus, Matthew 27 and 18, despite being punished for sins he did not commit, just, as, just like Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, God always works out his plan no matter how much men try to stop it. No matter how much men try to stop it. And again, the emphasis in those days as God spoke and was at work, there was no temple. The location didn't matter. The nation grew in Egypt. Over those 400 years, they grew in Egypt. Not the promised land. Not the holy land. Not in Palestine. They grew and worshipped without a temple. And it reminds us that 
as Stephen is giving this sermon to the Sanhedrin. It's not the place of worship that matters, but undoubtedly you have heard is the positions of one's heart before the Lord that is. A humble and contrite heart. Remember what the Lord said to the Samaritan woman when she asked where we should worship the Lord. Is it here? Is it there? Is it Where is it? Where can we worship the Lord? Jesus' response was this. Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain, in Samaria, nor in Jerusalem, the heartbeat of Judaism, will you worship the Father, John 4 and 21. It's not your physical location. God is not limited by time and space and matter. He transcends time, space, and matter. You can be anywhere to worship him, in a prison cell or in the palace office of Egypt. You can worship God. Next, Stephen moves on to the life of Moses. And during a challenging time in the nation's history where there was the real threat that the Hebrews would be wiped from the face of the earth. The first deliverer was born. God didn't choose a convenient time for Moses to be born. It was a day when Pharaoh commanded the Jewish midwives to kill the Hebrew boys to control any possible chance of rebellion. The slaughter of those innocent children would no doubt have rung a bell in the ears of Stephen's listeners and reminded them that just a few short decades ago, during the time of Christ's birth, Herod Herod issued the same command. And the cries of those children, the cries of those children, still echoed to that day. Moses was born, was saved, was preserved in Pharaoh's home. And during those horrible days in Israel's history, that first deliverer was born. In the same way God was with his son Jesus Christ when he was born. The Lord oversaw and superintended his birth, protected him from the wrath of Herod, the jealousy of Herod, sent him into the Egyptian wilderness until it was time to come home. Until it was time to begin his ministry and ultimately be rejected by his people. Even Moses, who in the eyes of many Jews was greater even than their national father Abraham, Even Moses was rejected. Abraham was rejected. Joseph was rejected. Even Moses was rejected by the people. When he first began to assert himself and to lead his people by saving an Israelite who was being abused by an Egyptian, there Moses, of course, savagely killed him. He probably thought that by defending him, the Israelites would would see his calling and rally to him, but they didn't. They did not see him as a deliverer. The very same thoughts of the ancient Hebrews were the opinions of the council and the Jews of Stephen's day. When the Israelites said to Moses, who made you a ruler and judge over us? They said the same thing, and I repeat it again in this message. We will not have this man to reign over us. So Moses fled. And would eventually encounter the living God in a burning bush. And again, Stephen emphasizes that God can speak to anyone, anywhere. Here was a manifestation of the presence of God in the burning bush. Moses, amazed that the bush was not consumed by the fire, turns. And the bush, the, the presence of God says to him, remove the sandals from your feet where you stand is holy ground, signifying that the presence of God was there on the earth in the burning bush. There was no tabernacle. There was no temple. God chose a bush to reveal his holy presence on the earth to his chosen deliverer. God is not limited in where he will reveal himself. He does not limit himself to revealing himself strictly in the Holy Land. He does not limit himself in his revelation in a building made by human hands. He revealed himself to Abraham in a foreign land. He spoke to Jacob and his family when he led them to a foreign land. Now, in the Midian desert, God was speaking to Moses. Moses. 
preparing him for Israel's next phase of salvation. Now, Christ has come as the final stage of salvation. God was working in very unexpected ways. Who would consider the Messiah of Israel to be a carpenter from the north country? Just like he was in Moses' day, Jesus was misunderstood and rejected and challenged throughout his servant ministry, just as Moses was. And just as the great prophet Jesus was. Moses would be the instrument that the Lord would use to deliver his people, deliver his law. And the prophet, Moses, the prophet, who would bring Israel to the edge of the promised land. And Christ is the ultimate expression of God's salvation. Romans 5 and 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ is the perfect fulfillment of God's love, a law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them, Matthew 5 and 17. And the prophet that Moses prophesied about in Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 18, the prophet who will bring his people into the heavenly promised land, into glory forever, Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. And the nation even rejected Moses. Now they have stubbornly rejected God's son. King David found favor with God and his great desire was to build a permanent temple for the Lord. But Isaiah the prophet proved that God does not live in temples made by human hands. Isaiah 66, 1-2 when he says, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Who are we in our humanity and arrogance attempting to try to build a home for God? Ultimately, the temple was just a building. In those days, the religious leaders were more intent on guarding the temple building and their traditions than they were in living lives, virtuous lives, lives of faithfulness and trust and mercy and submitting to the will of God that this Jesus of Nazareth, that this Jesus of Nazareth, a carpenter's son, is the Messiah and is their Savior and is the fulfillment of the law and is the final phase of God's deliverance for his people. And so as we come to the end of this chapter, as we just very quickly survey chapter 7. Stephen gives the ultimate defense of the Christian faith and turns the accusations against the Sanhedrin. In verse 51 he says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you will always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, just as those who rejected, rejected Moses, rejected Joseph, rejected the prophets, just as they did, so do you do now. Except your sin is that you are rejecting the Son of God, the just one, whom you have killed, verse 52. And the verdict, as Stephen stands there, with his face aglow as an angel, indwelt with the power of the Holy Spirit and with confidence in the faithfulness of God, he accuses them of being unfaithful and blaspheming God. The verdict? It was the vengeful, hateful wrath of the council. That was the verdict. And that's what we can expect today. Don't expect, beloved. Don't expect to be treated fairly in this world. We are in enemy territory. My children, all five, all six of them, the five at home, all want to be treated fairly. My 23-year-old all the way down to the three-year-old, they all want to be treated fairly. In the house, we have 14-year-old all the way down to three. They all want to be treated fairly. And we tell them over and over again and consistently, life is not fair. It's not fair. Find me a verse in the Bible where God says, 
Life's fair. It's not fair on this side of glory. It's challenging, hard, and difficult at times. So we should not expect to be treated fairly by the courts of this world when it comes to the testimony and the witness of Christ. After all, the world hates Christ. It will hate us. The Lord Jesus warns us of that. So, beloved, this chapter really encourages us as we see Stephen give his life as the ultimate witness to the faith. It encourages us as believers to stand fast in persecution. Literally, fasten yourself down to the person of Christ. Fasten yourself down to his promises. Fasten yourself to his presence and to the power of his spirit. Fasten yourself in that. Stand fast in the face of persecution, no matter the cost. In the final analysis, the ultimate case of martyrdom is the reaction to and a rejection of God. That's ultimately what martyrdom is. Those around us who react to and reject God. Stephen never once, as I said, defended himself throughout his sermon. He points to the tragic failures of mankind, but highlights the mercies of God, highlights the reality in his character that he is long-suffering. He is long-suffering with the nation of Israel through the centuries, throughout history, as they continually spit into the face of the living God to whom they had a covenant relationship with, God would chastise them as any loving father would, but so dear to them that he would send a deliverer to draw them back to himself, to save them from their sin. Stephen points to that, to the mercies of God. He points to the hope of Christ. He points to the gift, the provision of forgiveness and salvation. His message is one of the most effective and convincing sermons ever recorded in Scripture. Stephen did his job. Be a witness. Be ready in and out of season to give a defense for the hope that is in us. Stephen did that. He left the consequences and the conviction of the people, those who were listening to him, to God. He left that all to God. That's what we are commanded to do. Stand fast, testify, witness, and leave the consequences and the conviction of others to God. That's his work. They, of course, rejected the message hatefully. Hatefully. And took the law under their own hands And the ground was fertilized with the blood of the church's first martyr. Stephen wasn't wishing to die, of course. But he wasn't willing to deny the truth in order to live. He wasn't wishing to die. But he wasn't willing to deny the truth in order to live. His wish, you can hear it in the plead at the opening of the chapter. Brethren, he pleads with them, brethren, fathers, listen. His wish was that the leaders of his people would heed the call of God unto salvation in his son. That's the same message we take today. We ask those around us, heed the invitation of God to salvation and eternal life the forgiveness of sins, reconciliation, repent because God loves you and sent his son for you. He has a purpose for you, your life, and the rewards far outweigh the suffering of this world. That's the message we take to this lost and dying world. And what was the outcome? As Stephen faithfully preached the faithfulness of God and the depravity of mankind and the gift of salvation. What was the outcome? 
as Stephen is being stoned to death, heaven is opened. We see Christ, who is seated at the right hand of power, signifying his authority. We see him standing and observing everything that is happening to his child. It is the only instance that we find that Christ is standing at the right hand of power. He stands to receive his faithful servant into his eternal reward. The joy of the presence, of being in the presence of Jesus forever. And so we see Stephen giving his life as the ultimate witness after being a disciple on trial. And it was the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders who were guilty. And watching on, a young man, gifted, philosopher, master of many languages, a Pharisee of the Pharisee, a man who trusted in his righteous works, who had a zeal, a fire in his heart for the law of God. A young man named Saul of Tarsus, who approved of the stoning of this disciple that was on trial. I wonder what we're going to do with the Saul of Tarsus. I wonder what will become of him. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we just thank you again so much for the testimony of Stephen, the first of the deacons, a man who loved your people and served your people and ministered to your people and was called forth to be one of the first seven deacons recorded in the church's history. A man who would, as we said, would fertilize the very ground of salvation with his own blood. A man who stood fast and firm to the testimony and the witness of the faith. Father, we pray that we would be men and women, boys and girls, who would do the same. We don't wish to die. We do not wish for harm in our lives. But if it must be so, Father, strengthen us to testify of the truth of God in spite of these things. Give us courage in these dark days to be the lights of the gospel, to minister unto those who are broken, who are hurting, to those who are lost. Father, we give you thanks again for this time together. We lift up again all of those who are part of Glenridge. I would pray again your blessing on each and every one of us here. Until that day Christ returns or you call us home, we pray for your peace upon us, giving you thanks in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen.